about fashion, not about what people think, but at the end of the day, who's it about? Yeah, this thing's about Jesus. So glad uh, to just be here on this Sabbath day um, at uh, Oakwood University, uh, one of the great schools that we have. I have to say one of them uh, because I did attend here, like I told everyone, for about two weeks. So there is some Oakwood in me. Um, and there's just enough for you all to be kind enough to invite me uh, to spend some time to share with you. Um, I'm just glad. I love seeing everybody out here just to come and just worship God. And just we can just go ahead and get in the Word together tonight. I want to thank all those uh, who put this together. Y'all do this every Friday night? That's good. That's good. That's good. Good fellowship, good worship. Um, I want to get into the Word very quickly um, because we got some stuff to cover. And when people invite me places, I, I like to tell them I hope they know what they're getting. Um, I don't know how to be anything else but real and relevant. Um, that's just, I, I think that's just very important to do. I think what's missing a lot of times uh, from uh, our churches is just scratching where people are itching, uh, ask, answering questions that people are a actually answering and dealing with stuff uh, that we're actually dealing with. So um, we're in this topic, which I think is extremely relevant, uh, boy meets girl. And just so you guys do know, uh, we are tweeting on that. I'm not going to ask anyone to put away your phone. I'm going to ask you to actually pull out your phone. And if you have a Twitter account, we want you to tweet um, anything that comes to your mind through this message uh, tonight or even throughout this service um, and we want you to put the hashtag boy meets girl if you don't know what a hashtag is don't worry about what I'm talking about right now but um, here's the thing we want to get into tonight I need everybody's thinking caps on we're gonna really get into some very relevant uh, maybe even some controversial issues uh, coming up tonight and we're gonna approach these in a very clinical but also biblical uh, approach in a biblical way because we have this thing with relationships and that's very important right because all of us have some desire to be with somebody some of us have the gift of singleness what is it called gift of sin but here's the interesting thing about the gift of singleness I'm not gonna be talking about that tonight if you have the gift of singleness you also have the gift of abstinence yeah so let's say I ain't ever gonna get married but I'm gonna do marry people stuff no I ain't fair but 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 here's the thing in 2013, we not only have boy meets girl, but we got boy meets boy. And we also have girl meets girl. And so one of the things that we have to, I think, deal with is really be able to approach that subject um, in a proper way. Because if we can just be real, we're struggling with that thing. And we're struggling with it on a lot of different levels. And so what I want to really be able to do tonight is be able to approach that and really be able to have this generation be able to fix something that's happening inside of God's church and inside of the world today. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to use a text that some individuals have really had an issue with, and it's actually going to be found in 2 Samuel um, chapter 1, and I want to start at verse 25, and we're going to look at verse 26, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that actually came up in our question and answer, and they were actually twofold. One of the issues that came up with question and answer is this idea of male and female friendships and all that kind of stuff, opposite sex friendships, like how does that thing work out? And then some other things that came up that we didn't deal with on Thursday night, because I knew I was going to get to it tonight, is a lot of individuals were writing questions about same sex relationships. And so I want to deal with that tonight. Is that all right, everybody? I think this is a mature enough crowd that we can go ahead and deal with that because God expects us to be able to handle this thing from the Word of God. So y'all ready to get to work? Y'all ready to get to work? All right, 1 Samuel, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 1. I want to start at verse 25. This is David speaking here. And here's what he says. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. And here's what he says in verse 26. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. And here's where we have some issues. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. With your prayers and God's help, we're going to preach under the subject, a complexity of explanations a complexity of explanations. Let's go ahead and talk to Jesus. Not another second, nor an hour, nor another day. But at this moment, with my arms outstretched, Lord, I need you to make a way as you have done so many times before. And God, you've done it through a window or an open door. So Father, here I am. I stretch my hands to thee. 
And I pray that you would come rescue me because I need you right away. Now, Spirit of the living God, can you just fall afresh on us? This is our prayer in Jesus' name. That all of God's children say amen. And amen. By the time we look at 2 Samuel chapter 1, something interesting has happened. David has just been informed that his best friend Jonathan has, has been killed. And as you look through the book of 1 Samuel and you start to see this incredible friendship that has been developed between David and Jonathan, you really get a template in the Bible for what biblical, authentic friendship ought to look like. It's incredible what you see between these two. I mean, as a matter of fact, when they first look at one another, uh, David, pardon me, Jonathan actually says that the moment he sees David, his soul is knit to him. So much so, I mean, he gets his allegiance to David, like that's his homie, that's his boy. They are extremely tight. And so what David does in 2 Samuel is as upon hearing upon the death of Jonathan, he begins to write this poem. And he begins to write this poem about Jonathan and all the different things that he's meant to him. And all this stuff sounds really good, but when we get to verse 26, that's when it messes things up for a lot of different people. Because the biblical author says this, and I looked at as many translations as I could find, and none of them said it, in my opinion, the right way. But they say this very clearly, Jonathan, man, how the mighty have fallen in battle. Your love for me was greater than that of a woman. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I have to do when I get to heaven. I'm going to find the author of 2 Samuel, and I'll be like, yo, dude, you really made my job harder. You could have said this in a completely different way. Because there's a lot of people who look at this particular text, and they say this proves very clearly that David and Jonathan had a same-sex sexual relationship. And so what I want to do is I want to deal with that text, and then I want to springboard off of that text and to deal with some of the issues I think that we're dealing with with same-sex relationships. But here's the thing I want to open up with us first, because this idea of friendship is something that's very important, I think, for all of us when we go through our college life, our dating life, and all that stuff. All of us, God has called us to have friends. But here's what I want to let you know. There is always a temptation in your friendship for the friendship to become sexualized. There's always going to be that temptation. And here's what I want to tell you something very clearly, that when sex comes into the relationship, something happens. Y'all quiet. And some of y'all want to say, yep, it sure does. <laughs> but, but, but here's the idea. When sex comes into the relationship, something happens. And here's the thing that God wants us to be able to do. Can two people just be able to have this pure, whether opposite sex, same sex, have a relationship, I mean a pure and holy friendship without it being sexual? Because let's be honest, and ladies, you are the ones who usually have the biggest problems. In other words, being bothered with this. Don't you just hate it when you're really cool with a guy? And then after a while, he starts to develop feelings for you, and you're just saying, oh my gosh. Like, dude, it's like, can't we just be friends? Because now when they start getting feelings for you, now when you text them, they start reading it differently. You just want to go to the movies, and they're thinking it's something else. And I mean, you just bent out of shape because you're like, dude, please, I do not want you. I just want to be your friend. Don't you hate that? Now, ladies, y'all can help by stop laying on their shoulder. You know, and like sitting on their lap, talking about, you know, that's just my friend. Like, I'm serious, I made the mistake this week. I saw somebody, and they were sitting there and, and doing whatever, and I was like, oh, how long y'all been together? And they were like, we're just friends. I'm like, really? <laughs> if I had friends like you, you know, I mean, so we, we gotta be careful with that. But uh, in, in psychology today, um, this one contributor to psychology today, here's what I want to break down to us. Remember, I, I'm just real practical. I don't have a lot of, uh, you know, platitudes and neat things to say. I just want to be practical so we can actually take some stuff and apply it uh, to our lives. But Heidi Reader does a survey, and I want to tell you what the survey is about, about 2,500 people. Don't, don't let people just say the survey says, and you don't know the sample of what that survey is. 96% of people said this, and there was like three people they surveyed. So about 2,500 individuals participate in this survey, and what Heidi Reader wants to talk about is this idea about four different categories or types of attractions that are found amongst friends. Y'all still with me so far? 
So here, I want to go through the first one. The first one, she says, is called friendship attraction. What kind of attraction? Now, friendship attraction, I want to read it just the way uh, that they had it in psychology today. Friendship attraction is not romantic or sexual in nature, but is the kind of attraction you feel when drawn to someone because you like that person and enjoy being with him or her. It's the type of attraction that most heterosexuals presumably feel for their same-sex friends. Y'all got that? So it's this friendship attraction, like you like video games, I like video games. You like this, I like this. Nothing else going on, you're cool, you're fun to be around, I like to be around you. That's the type of friendship attraction. So you see, a lot of different people can have that. I have that with my boys, you can even have that with people of the opposite sex. But there's that first part of attraction, it's a friendship attraction. But then Heidi says this, that she found this, that there is a romantic attraction in the second category. And it's important not to confuse, as she says, with physical or sexual attraction. I need you all to follow me. While the, two can go, while the two can go together, it's certainly possible to find someone physically attractive but have no desire to be in a romantic relationship with them. Romantic attraction, so, so, so in other words, here's what she's saying. And you know some people like this. You have some friends, and you're like, yo, they are fine. Like, I ain't gonna lie. Like, my homegirl, some of you guys say, yo, she is fine, but I would never date her. Like, I'd never do it. Part of the reason might be because, you know, you guys are friends, and she's told you all her stuff, and you're just like, nah, you, you look good, but you drama. So we friends. But you think they look good. Does that make sense? Romantic, I think you look good, but I'm not interested in dating you. And I, I can do it. I can say that. What a wonderful child of God you are. Your parents were blessed, put you together all the right way. God bless somebody. <laughs> right? Then here's what we have, the next kind uh, uh, of section of this thing in friendship. The subjective physical slash sexual attraction. This refers to feeling drawn to the other physically and perhaps wanting to make sex a part of the relationship. Almost a third of her survey, respondents currently felt this form of attraction for their friend. In other words, what they're saying is, there are in this level of attraction, and she said this is what a third of individuals were, it's not only do I think you look good, but if there was an opportunity for me to sleep with you, Oh, you better believe that I would love to take it. And here is the thing. That's where I think a lot of us are and a lot of us go wrong. We just have this neat term called friends with benefits. Because here's the thing that happens. There are some of us who are like, yo, you're very attractive. And it's for me, you're attractive to me. And I would love to, if I had the opportunity, sleep with you. And so here's what ends up happening. You are friends with them. They have some issues maybe in their relationship. But because you're a friend, they'll come to you to talk about it. And while they're talking about it, they're a little weak maybe and vulnerable. And so you're able to say, you know what? Listen, I know what's going on now. I'm a real friend. I'm going to show you how much of a real friend that I am. No, I'm going to do that, because like, whatever he's not giving you, trust me, I got, because I'm your friend. <laughs> now, 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 let's be honest, some of us, and we've taken advantage of that thing, because here's what happens, when you're friends with someone, your guard gets down just a little bit, doesn't it? You feel a little more comfortable laying on them, being places alone with them, doing those things with them, but here's the, here's the issue, you're sexually attracted to that friend and now an opportunity comes for you all to have sex and after you do that, and when I say have sex, it could be intercourse, could be kissing, could be oral sex, could be all kinds of stuff, but the moment that happens, the friendship changes. Everything changes. And she says, a third of the people said, that's what I feel for my friend. So if we were to survey this entire group, there are some of us who have to be honest with ourselves and say, you know what, not only do I think my friend is attractive, but man, if a door was open, I'm going to go through it and mess up the friendship. Here's a final kind of friendship that she uh, describes, or attraction, excuse me, objective physical sexual attraction. And here's how she describes that. This refers to thinking that one's friend is physically attractive in general terms, but not feeling the attraction themselves. In other words, you can look at somebody 
And so, you know, I could see why someone thinks they're cute. I just don't. No, I, and I'm that way with a lot of celebrities and stuff like that. Like some people like during, I'm not going to you know, put it out there because that, that could be kind of messy, but some people are like, yo, you know, oh my goodness, she's so fine. I'm like, I can see why she's fine, but I'm cool. I can see why people think she's fine, but I'm cool. And that's some of the attraction that we may have. I think my friend, I can see why people think they're attractive, but I'm not attractive. And here is the thing I want us to understand and get. You need to learn. What do you need to do? Learn. You need to learn how to be just a friend. I need y'all to hear that. Because you mess up your friendships by turning them sexual. And here's the crazy part about it. Now, I'm just satisfied to you, I'm going to get right, right, right back to this. Here's the crazy part about it. Somebody you're friends with, it becomes sexual. And if it's in the Adventist context, guess what? You're going to see him again. When I moved back, listen to me carefully, to Southern California to pastor, when I lived out there and grew up there, I didn't always know Jesus living in California. So when I came back, a lot of my friends started coming to my church and sitting behind my wife. <laughs> Talking about, well, it's cool because we were just, uh-huh. Here's what you have to be able to do. If that attraction starts to come towards that person and that thing starts to come out, you've got to be honest with yourself and admit that to yourself and be clear with yourself that, you know what, I'm starting to feel something a little different and start to be able to share that thing because I'm telling you what the devil would love to do is take a pure and holy friendship between two men, between two women, between a man and a woman and sexualize that thing because he knows that once that happens, the friendship will not be the same. Are y'all listening to me? So David and Jonathan, listen to me carefully, have a pure friendship because it's not tainted with sexuality. Because let me tell you something, even when you are married, and this is why he says we have a pure friendship. He says, because you know what? We don't have romantic stuff that makes us unable to be objective anymore. Because let me tell you, when sex comes into the relationship, you are no longer as objective as you used to be. Even when you're married. Like, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about, Pastor? Let me tell you. Before you were having sex, if someone or you, let's say you, you, say you and your wife are married or dating, and, you know, before she's like, hey, honey, do you think you can take out the, the trash? You know, you're over here visiting. I need some help taking out the trash. You might be like, nah, nah, I'm, I'm cool on that. But now y'all having sex. And she asks you to take out the trash. And you don't feel like it. But now you say to yourself, if I don't take out this trash now, I might miss something later. So although I don't feel like it, I'm going to do it anyway. You're no longer objective. Are y'all following me? There are certain arguments that you know that before you have sex, you would not give up. You dig it in. No, this is the right way. I don't see it that way. I don't know what you're talking about. But now that you're having sex, you're like, dude, if I don't give in now, somebody have a it changes things. And so what David is saying is, hey, listen, we don't have that kind of thing in our relationship like women and men do in their relationship. Therefore, our love for one another is completely pure. No extra motives added to it. No nothing. We are straight up friends. Straight up friends. But the question is, why would the author describe it in this way? Why did you say your love for me was greater than that of a woman? And here's one of the reasons why. Back in the day, ladies didn't have the same kind of rights as men. As a matter of fact, so much so that in the New Testament, when they're counting the, the loaves and the fish and all that kind of good stuff, they're sitting there and they will count the men, they will count the children, but guess what they leave out? They leave out the women. Women during that day, although yes, they would fall in love with individuals, y'all follow me, they wouldn't just marry someone simply out of love. There was security in that thing because I can't get stuff on my own. So when I connect with you, 
I get your name, you have to take care of me for the rest of my life. And it was set up in such a way that if I'm with you and I'm taken care of and you die, your brother got to come take care of me. And then if he dies, his brother got to come take care of him. And if all you go through all your brothers, you got a slew of cousins that they are obligated to take care of me. And so when a woman would get hooked up, she would not only be looking at it for love, but she was also looking at it for security. And so what David is saying is, listen, I got women I know who are after me because you know what? They know one day I'm about to be the king. And because I know that I'm going to be the king, there's security that's going to come through that relationship. So yes, I'm not saying different women don't love me, but there's an ulterior motive there. There's something else. So he says, you know what, Jonathan? Your love was greater than that of a woman. You know why? Because you have no ulterior motives by hooking up with me. As a matter of fact, you risked your life for our friendship. You weren't friends with me because of what I could give you. You weren't friends with me because of all that other stuff. You were just friends with me because at the end of the day, we had a pure friendship. And some of these women that I'm hooking up with, yes, I know they might love me as we get married and I'm the king, but you know what? They also want security too. So your stuff, your connection with me, your friendship with me had no strings attached. Does that make sense, everyone? Now, the question I really want to get into now, and we're going to transition just a little bit, is a lot of individuals have used this particular text to really hone in on the, on, on the fact that David and Jonathan had a same-sex relationship. That, that's, that's a champion thing. That's one of those texts out there. And so what I want to do is I want to approach that, and I want to approach this subject now of same-sex relationships. But in order for us to do that, what we have to do is see if that's true, that they had a same-sex relationship, although I don't believe they did, but it has to fit in the context of the entire Bible. Because when you're studying the Bible, and I hope everyone here, I know we at Oakwood and all that kind of stuff, you don't read the Bible, you study it. And people say, oh, I need to read my Bible. No, you don't. You need to study your Bible. And some of us get impressed. You know, I read like eight chapters a day. You don't know what them eight chapters are talking about because you're just reading through it. No, you got to study that thing. And when I'm looking at the, at the Bible and the text, I'm looking at four different contexts. Number one, I'm looking at the immediate context, what happens before and immediately after the, after the verse. Then I want to look at the context of the chapter. Then I want to look at the context that that chapter and that verse fits in the entire book. And then I want to look at the context that that book fits inside the entire context, rather, of the Bible. And so here's what we're saying. If David and Jonathan had a same-sex relationship, that better fit in the context of the entire Bible. And so in order to understand, I think, the context of the entire Bible, one of the best books and the most important book, I think, for all of us to understand, I'm more of a teacher than a preacher anyway, so y'all just stay with us. One of the best books that you have to really understand actually is the book of Genesis. That's one of the best books, and particularly the first two chapters, because it's right there in Genesis that you learn everything you need to know about God. You don't need to read any, I'm, I'm telling you, study other parts of the Bible, I'm telling you, but if all we had was Genesis 1 and 2, you'd be straight understanding who God is. Because in Genesis chapter 1, we are very clearly establishing who God is simply when he says, in the beginning, God created. He said, well, wait a second, why is that clear? What is that establishing? It is establishing before there's even a sacrifice of God, God is showing the love of God because when it says he created, whatever he's created, he's creating for you. He's giving. He's automatically giving. And you don't just give. And here's what we know about God. He is so off the chain. That as he's creating, he is not just giving you a house. He's not just giving his new creations uh, a little corner. He's giving them a planet. And not only is he giving them a planet, but he's setting this thing up. And, and, and you know he's a romantic God because he's got like flowers up in that place. I mean, he, he's got all kinds of stuff. He's got water that, that is so clear that the folk who make that Fiji stuff, they don't even know what they're talking about when they're talking about the best water out there. I mean, God is hooking this place up. And after everything he says, y'all know how the story goes, he's looked back and he's like, yo, this is good. God is setting us up and showing us what his ideal is. And so here's what then God does. He says, you know what, I, 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 this planet is off the chain. It's cool. I've had angels. I've got other folk I've made, but I'm going to do something really crazy. I'm going to put together 
some beings, but here's the difference. They're going to be made in my image. I'm going to do this crazy because I'm just crazy. So he goes to the ground and he, and he puts them together and, and, he makes, and he makes Adam. But he's like, you know what? The, the image isn't complete because I'm not complete just by being God Father, but there's also the Son and there's also the Holy Spirit. So he says, here's what I'm going to do. He says, I want to see if Adam kind of figures out if he's complete or not. I want Adam figure that thing out. So Adam's walking around. He's looking two by two, two by two. I'm naming it. Wow, look at that. And I'm looking around. What's up? So God says, ha ha, you got it. Go to sleep. <laughs> like, go to sleep, dude. He's like, go to sleep. And so here's what God does. He's sleeping and he reaches inside him. You guys know the story. But he reaches inside him and he pulls out the, 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 this, this rib and, and he creates woman. And Adam wakes up. And I, I can't wait to, to, to see the Blu-ray uh, in heaven so I can see the look on his face. But he had to be blown because here's what he does. He doesn't even ask her for her name. He just said, I'm going to name you. <laughs> He's like, there's no dating. I don't even want to know your name. Whatever it is, you're Eve. I don't care. I'm just going to call you something. And Israel says, girl, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You, 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 I, I, I got to have you. I don't care because you are it. And I can see God watching this exchange, just laughing, saying, bravo, Adam, you finally got it. Because God understood this, that the image of God is not complete with just you, Adam. It's not just complete with you, Eve. It's complete when both of you come together. So I know God loves it when Adam says these words, when he says, look, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and the two are going to be one. One flesh. That was God's ideal. And then he even goes further with that thing. He says, now watch this. Here's what I want you guys to do. I want there to be more just like you. So here's what I want you to do. Be fruitful and multiply. And I can imagine Adam and Eve like, well, how do we do that? Let me show you. <laughs> See, y'all think that's kind of weird, right? But, I mean, God's like, let me, let me show you. And, and they're like, and we're supposed to replenish the earth? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> and, 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 just, and just replenish. Just, okay, cool. And God does something incredible, too, because his ideal was every woman that came into the earth had the ability to recreate life. Every, everyone, everyone in Genesis 1, 2. He wants that to take place. And so there in Genesis 1 and 2, I need you guys to get this because we're setting the stage. I need you guys to get this, that God is setting forth what his ideal is. Not just when it only comes to relationships, but his ideal, what he wants for this world. And here's the thing about God. His ideal is always going to be that, so much so to the point that in Revelation it says that God comes down from heaven and he doesn't give us this entire different planet we live on, but he comes and makes this one new again because he says, this is my ideal that y'all live on this one. Except I got to make some things different now. But here's the other part about God's ideal. In Genesis 1 and 2, he gives us his ideal with everything that he wants, even when it comes to diet. Mercy is quiet. And I'm not sitting here preaching to you like somebody. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm a flexitarian. I'm flexible, but that's not God's ideal because in order to get the food, in order to get the chicken, you got to kill the chicken. And here, I'm going to tell you, when we get to heaven, because God keeps a lot of his ideal, ain't going to be no chickens that we can eat in heaven. I'm just going to keep that real. Because you're going to walk up to the chicken, and in order to eat the chicken, you got to kill the chicken. And in heaven, the chicken might talk back to you and be like, yo, dog. <laughs> now, Back home on earth, you done eat 50,000 of my brothers and sisters, and now we're on the other side now, dog. You're going to have to hold off on this one. <laughs> but it's all about God's idea. Are y'all with me so far? This is God's idea. But then watch something that happens. Genesis 3 takes place. And when Genesis 3 takes place, it's not that God's ideal changes, but man changes. God's ideal never, 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 never switches away, never goes into a different place. But now what happens is the ideal that God had for relationships, and we're talking about that, now has changed. Never God's ideal 
that two individuals became one outside of marriage. Never his ideal. Never his ideal that two individuals of the same sex got together in a relationship. Not his ideal. How do I know? It wasn't in Genesis 1 and 2. Anything that God wants for his creation was found in Genesis 1 and 2. And there are things inside, outside of Genesis 1 and 2, particularly when it comes to understanding relationships, that there are a lot of us who are not living up to that ideal when it comes to our relationships. And I got to tell you something, that is sin. A lot of us walking around, sleeping around with a lot of different folk of the opposite sex, not God's ideal. There's something wrong with that. There's a lot of us walking around and, and having issues with individuals of the same sex, not God's ideal. There's something going on there because what God is trying to get us all back to is his ideal. You know why? God's got this crazy idea that his way works best. Like, no, he's like kind of crazy. He's like, you know what, guys? It's really interesting. If you actually do some of the things, all the things that I said, your life will actually be better. He, God's weird that way. But our problem is that a lot of us have strayed from God's ideal. And one of the things that has really been messing with the church, been messing with our schools, been messing with society, is this idea of same-sex relationships. I'm just going to be very frank with us. The church is ignorant when it comes to this stuff. We're ignorant. Most of us have no idea what we're talking about. No idea how to deal with it. No idea how to handle it. And because of that, God is unable to use us to do some things that need to be done to help him deal with the devil trying to mess with his ideal. And so what we want to be able to do, and I'm going to take a, 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 a very right now, clinical approach to this thing when it comes to homosexuality, same-sex relationships. Because there are a lot of different ways we're going to describe this thing. You're going to see exactly why. You guys still doing okay? All right. There are four types of sexual orientations. How many types? Four. The first is heterosexual, opposite sex, individuals coming together relationship. The second, homosexual, two individuals of the same sex coming together. The other is bisexual. That means opposite sex or same sex, I can go both ways. And then there's a fourth, transgender. And transgender is an umbrella term used to describe those who cross or transcend culturally defined categories of sex and gender. Does that make sense? So a transgender individual is somebody who is a male but presents some female qualities or maybe dresses a little feminine or vice versa. That's transgender. Now, homosexuality is not something that's easy to define. And I want to read something to you just the way I wrote it. Homosexuality can be defined as an orientation and or a behavior. What can it be? Or a? There are some with a homosexual orientation. And they may be attracted to those of the same sex, yet never act on that attraction. Then there are some who define themselves as heterosexual in orientation, yet participate at times in homosexual encounters. And there are a lot of different variables when it comes to this idea of explaining homosexuality. In other words, here's how we have to be very careful, because this is where the church really messes up. You want to put everybody in one box. And so you see somebody who has some feminine qualities, and they're a male, and you all of, me, all, all, all of a sudden, you're already saying, oh, you know what? Nope. Yep. I know it. They're gay. All that kind of stuff. How do you know they're not just transgender? You see somebody, you're sitting there, and, and, they, and you see, it looks like they got some attraction towards that, 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 you know, that, that same sex. I know what they do. No, you don't. They just might be struggling with the attraction, but never perform the action. 
And then you look at some guys, you're like, oh my goodness, look at that. He just loves all them females or all those males that she's around. And you know what? They love to date and be in a relationship with someone of the opposite sex, but they love sometimes to be a part of physical encounters with the same sex. And what we try and do is put everyone in the same box and try and prescribe the same thing when some folk need different measures of help because of where they are in their lives. But because we're ignorant and we put everyone in the same category, there are people who are dying and we have no idea how to deal with it because we just want to put everyone in one box. It's not easy. Because everyone who falls, and there are some people in this congregation right now who are identifying with different areas of what has just been said, and it makes sense. And what we've got to be able to do as a people is not be so arrogant and think we understand everybody's story. You have no idea which category they may fall in. If that makes sense to me, you say amen. amen. Now, explaining this idea of homosexuality, what I want to do is there are two basic perspectives no matter which school of thought you come in. There are two basic perspectives. How many perspectives? Two. One are psychosocial factors, which we're going to describe as nurture. This is what we'll call nurture. And then there are biological factors, which we'll call nature. All right? So we're going to deal with nurture, psychosocial, and we're going to deal with biological, which is nature. And I want to investigate some of the research that's done. I did a lot of research on that, and I want to share some of it with you. There are four theories from the psychosocial theory of homosexuality that, that I want to talk about tonight. There's a plenty of others, but there are four that I want us to understand. The first is the social learning theories. One theory for homosexuality points to a lack of adequate heterosexual experiences during childhood. Therefore, reckoning that homosexuality comes from a deprivation of good heterosexual experiences. In other words, some individuals, they're growing up and they have a lack of adequate experiences with heterosexuality. Does that make sense? Then there's the second theory, the inverted version of the first theory. It presumes that homosexuality, and remember, we're just going through theories. We're just, we're just going through some theories now. It presumes that homosexuality results from negative experiences that one has had with the opposite sex. Not enough positive experiences in life with the opposite sex. In other words, this theory is saying, you know what? When I was kind of growing up, I had some very negative experiences with the opposite sex. And so they're saying with individuals like that, sometimes they feel that that can contribute to a homosexual lifestyle. A third explanation is what is called the social learning theory. And that is individuals who have early sexual contact with a homosexual serves to reframe a young person's sexual orientation. Reframes their sexual orientation. So as I'm growing up, I have sexual contact, whether that is wanted, whether it's uh, forced upon, but I have early sexual contact with someone of the same sex. And in that, they say, that reframes my thinking and now that is what becomes more normal for me. That's number three. Then number four, and this is an interesting one for me, is based on research by Dr. Storms, and he does this all the way back to 1981. And here's what he says. Up until about age 12, we as boys and girls, as we grow up, are what we call are in a homeosocial stage. In other words, up to age 12, we spend time mostly with people of the same sex. Boys with boys, girls with girls. Because at that time, it's kind of like, you know, you got the cootie thing, and you're like, ah, you know, I, I don't want to do it. Now, that changes, you know, pretty quick. But here's what Dr. Storms found out. Because in the research, even current to this day, they find that more males have the homosexual, homosexual lifestyle than females. That's what they found. And here's one of the reasons Dr. Storms' research says this is true. Because during the homeosocial stage, boys develop their sexuality faster than girls. But he says, and they found, that we develop our sexuality when we're hanging around, guess who? All boys. And that is why, I'm gonna be very frank with you, because y'all can handle this. Boys, growing up, sometimes are very comfortable watching certain movies with other boys in the same room. Dorm rooms.
They are. Very comfortable seeing one another in different ways because your sexuality began to come out at a time where you were around all boys. So it's real comfortable for you. A lot of times we can get into babbling. And those are just some of those theories as far as the social learning theories. Y'all got that so far? So what they're saying is there are these four different manners that different people grow up, have different experiences, and that contributes to homosexuality. That is nurture. But then there's a second one. And those are biological factors, and that is nature. And there's been some research that shows that there are also biological contributors to homosexuality. Now, that research can get very heady, getting into X and Y chromosomes. I'm not trying to get into all that kind of stuff. But here's basically what they're saying. You can be born with it. Now, we as Christians, we hate that. Like, no, we do not like that at all. We're like, oh, no, uh uh-uh, no, you can't be born with that. No, no, sir. So, you know, there's that battle there because a lot of people say, no, no, I was born this way. You're like, no, you weren't, no, you weren't, no, you weren't, you weren't born that way, blah, blah, and we get into all that. Now, here's what I want to say. The Bible actually talks about that. And I want to show you where the Bible does in Exodus 20 and verse 5. Exodus 20 and verse 5. You can't believe you're born with this thing. The psychologists are telling us that it's a biological thing. That there's a part of it. There's something that just kind of happens where we come in with this bent. Here's what, here's what God says. He's given the Ten Commandments. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting, watch this, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. So God is saying there's some stuff that you had nothing to do with that gets passed down from the third and the fourth generation. But somebody else says something, really cool lady, Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 476. He who has determined to enter the spiritual kingdom will find that all the powers and passions of unregenerate nature backed by the forces of the kingdom of darkness are arrayed against him. (laughs) Y'all miss that. What she's saying is there are forces of unregenerate nature, she says, that the kingdom of darkness is trying to bring out of you to use against you. She continues, she continues on page 477 where she says this, each day he must renew his consecration each day to the battle with evil. Old habits, and I love this word she uses, hereditary tendencies to wrong will strive for mastery. I love the way that woman writes. And against these, he is to ever be on guard, striving for Christ's strength for victory. In other words, what the old lady is saying is very clear, that there is some hereditary stuff inside of you that is striving for mastery of you. And here's my biggest problem with a lot of us. We don't think sin is that hard, that dope. And when I say that dope, here's what I mean. Sin is out of control. We don't give it enough credit, not at all. Not even one generation removed from sin and we got a murderer. You would think righteousness might make it, just a little bit down the line, but here is the idea that sin is so strong, it is so ridiculous that sin, according to Bible, and she even says this in Adventist home, that mothers give towards their children almost unconquerable tendencies towards evil, love this last word, as a birthright. The Bible, Sister White, all kinds of folk are making something clear. Sin gets in us and we come into the world with stuff. All of us, every last one of us in this room right now has stuff. And my biggest problem with our stuff is sometimes you want to look at somebody else like you ain't got no stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because some of our stuff, people can see, and some of the stuff, other folk can't see. But let me tell you something very clearly. It don't matter if you can see or if I can see, because the one who it matters to sees it all. And we all, listen, y'all got to hear me carefully. We all have got stuff. And a lot of the stuff we have, you did not have a choice in getting. You came in with it. Born in sin. Shaping in iniquity. Sin gave us some stuff. In every single day of your life, the devil is striving to bring out your stuff. And we got the audacity sometimes to go through a day without praying. I'm telling you. And folk, the devil is shrewd. Sometimes your stuff won't come out to the least opportune moment. And we all have got it. And so when individuals say to me, you know what, Pastor? I just feel like I was just born with this thing. I understand. Because there's stuff I know that I came out, and I'm just born. I'm like, I, 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 I get it. Some of you are more angry than others. Some of you might not have the stuff towards the, the, the same sex, but you got the stuff towards the opposite sex. Stuff! And sin does that to everybody. And that's why it was satanic genius to get Adam and Eve to sin before there was a child, guaranteeing that every single X and Y chromosome would be tainted in sin with the exception of one, Jesus Christ. But yet, you can't be born with that because sin doesn't do that. Are you crazy? Sin ain't no joke. And it messed with the gene pool. Nature. And here's the thing about sin. The devil doesn't care what the sin looks like. We do. You think he cares what kind of sins you do? No, just sin. So what the psychologist is saying, there's some that say biological, you're born with it. There's others that say, you know what? You were socialized into it. And so we've got these two that go back and forth. But here's what I love. What one particular doctor, Dr. Burmett, and I'm almost done, y'all are doing excellent tonight, starts to do as he says, there's something else at work here with biological and with psychosocial factors. And I want to quote some of his research. I want to quote some of his research. Here's what he says. Unfortunately, the physical versus mental and nature versus nurture controversies remain alive, well, and mischievous in regard to the correct understanding of human sexuality. In other words, you say, you know what? There's a nurture argument that you're nurtured with your sexuality. There's a nature argument you're born with your sexuality. Therefore, we approach the topic with a healthy suspicion of any person, listen, who claims to know the cause of homosexuality. Instead, we promote a model that integrates both biological and psychosocial factors. Along with Berman, we believe that sexuality emerges from the interdependencies of biology, awareness, and the facts and artifacts of public life. In other words, here's what Dr. Berman's saying. That you may be born with something, but simply born with it isn't what gets it to come out. Whatever you're born with must be combined with a psychosocial factor that brings out the thing that you're born with. Are y'all following this? So, so, so let, let's give some practical examples. So if you come in, born into this world, and you just got this feeling, when I see the boys on TV and I'm a boy, I'm more attracted to them than I see the girls. That's what I'm born with. I feel that. But you're growing up in a home and you have a socialized a, a factor and sphere where you are constantly surrounded by positive heterosexual experiences. 
The thing that you are born with does not come out because of the things and the environment that are around you are not helping pull it out. The reverse is also true as well, and, and, and they found this in even some research. There are individuals who, yes, have gone to prison, heterosexual in nature, have had a homosexual experience, have come out, and guess what they're not? They don't go and start dating men all of a sudden, because guess what they are at the heart? They were heterosexual. And they weren't socialized in the yes, had experience, but they didn't grow up in that. And so what is there to pull out? You can, yeah, I had a bad experience with that, but you're not pulling anything out of me because it wasn't there. And here is what this teaches us about our families and everything. We must be careful of the environment that we create because it could pull out some stuff that you had no idea was there. <laughs> There are some individuals, yes, your children, all that stuff, if we have some parents here, and you know it if you're struggling with different things in this world right now, that you had these feelings and you didn't know what to do with them, but the way you grew up and the home you grew up in helped pull that stuff out. It wasn't just a feeling. It wasn't just you being born with it. It's your environment fed what you were born with. And that's why environment is everything because the environment can pull out of you something that you came into this world with and that doesn't only just go for same-sex relationships and, and, and all that different kind of stuff it even goes uh, to the idea uh, of genius and, and musicianship and all that kind of stuff if someone is born and they found who are just musical geniuses They've got that, that in them, they, 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 just, they just got it. They understand the piano, understand music, all that stuff. But they grew up in my home, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> you can have all the biology you want for the genius of music, but if you grow up in my home, I'm not a musician. Same thing happens to a lot of us in the hood. There are young black men and women in the hood that have got all the emotional intelligence to succeed above everyone. It's in them, they just have got it, but they're growing up in a place that can't pull it out of them. But they got it. And there's some of you right now, there are some of you right now who are struggling with the same sex relationship, attraction, uh, action. You're struggling with that thing. And I understand, you're like, I was born with it. And not only, Pastor, was I born with it, but I grew up in a home where I never had positive experiences the other way. And it was the perfect storm. And so that's why I'm careful. When I see individuals struggling in the ways that I know that they can be struggling, because you know what? I don't know what kind of home you grew up in. The person who's running around, poking everything with the skirt. Yeah, you, you, you had tendencies towards the opposite sex. And you know what? That, 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 that's, that's good, that's great. But you know what? You grew up in a home where you saw your father bringing in woman after woman after woman. And so now that thing towards the, the opposite sex now became something out of control because of what you were socialized with. So it's not enough to simply be born with it. And it's not enough to simply grow up around it. The two come together and create this incredible storm. And one of the problems that we have as a church, and I'm almost done, I'm almost done. One of the problems that we have as a church is we have no idea how to deal with that. Our churches, listen, this is one of the big things that happens at my church. And this is something I talked about at Rubido. We, we, we talk about pornography and we're straight because here's what we're big at. And our discipleship model is we create environments for life change because we understand we don't change lives but we need to create environments where life change can take place and here's my problem with the church it's a lot of our churches we don't have a safe environment for life change to take place and here's how I know it's not safe because if two individuals come into most of our churches Struggling, struggling, trying to figure out what their sexuality is and how to do all that stuff, we ain't got nothing for them. 
but dirty looks. Little sermons that we kind of throw out there every way to just remind them where they're going. We don't have anything. We don't. And part of the reason we don't have anything is because we don't understand anything. There's some folk that grew up with some incredible stuff and came into this world with some incredible stuff. And guess where's the first place they should be able to come to? Church. That's the first place. Because in our churches should be an environment where life change can take place. And that's why most of us can come to churches time and time again, and you're still the same. Because the environment in that place isn't about life change. It's about good worship. It's about a good order of service. It's about making sure that everything's kind of lined up with what we do, but it's not there for life change. And that's why sometimes at Rubido, different things happen that take us off script, okay? Because this is an environment created for life change. That's why there are times when we make the appeal, when I'm preaching on pornography, it's a safe environment. And so people, I don't ask them to come forward, they just walk forward. Because it's safe. Not safe to continue in, but safe to be set free from. And I got a question. Is this school safe? Is your dorm room safe? Is it a safe place where somebody can come and know that they're going through something and say, hey, can you help me out? And they not get a, a backwards look. They not get a gossip. They not get a tweet, a text, or something like that. Is this place safe? And if it's not, it's up to us to make it that way. Because folk are dying in this stuff. And they're not coming out because of us. I'm tired of seeing our people die. And I'm going to tell you straight up, that's on all of us. That's not on just those who are leading churches and pulpits. That's on all of us. We got to make it safe. Now, I want to close with this quote. Don't, don't play for me just yet. I want to close with this quote. One of the best books I've ever read on sexuality, authentic human sexuality. Grab it. But here's what the authors say, because we got this still this thing that I'm uncomfortable with. Biological, psychosocial, nature, nurture. Got to figure that out. So here's what they say. This centers on the question of whether a homosexual orientation is a matter of choosing to have sexual desire for a same-sex person. The short answer is that although a person decides whether or not to act on these desires, a person with a homosexual orientation is not responsible for the sexual desire any more than a heterosexual person is responsible for sexual desire directed toward an opposite sex person. Not responsible for it, but they continue. Man, I love this. This is not to say that human beings are merely passive agents and therefore pawns of biological and psychosocial influences. Human beings come to be choice-making creatures through the process of moral development. This primarily involves learning the meaning of sexuality in a social context. As individuals grasp the spiritual meaning of sexuality in terms of being drawn into significant relationships with others, here's what they have. They develop a self-structure that becomes increasingly capable of making choices. So here's what crazy, what the two psychologists are making very clear. Yes, you came in with biological factors. Yes, those things were socialized. But here's the one thing biology and sociology cannot take from you, and that's your freedom of choice. You and I choose what we do, even when everything in us cries out against us. 
There are some of us who are coming into this thing with, with the same sex attraction, and it's, it's inside of us. You're born in it, and you are socialized in it, and it wants to come out, but what you've got to understand is no matter what your biology is and your sociology is, you have a choice. And the question is today, what is it that we will choose? We choose. One of the greatest gifts that God has given every single one of us next to his son, Jesus Christ, is the ability to choose. Nothing chooses for you. I grew up single parent home, Los Angeles, California. My biology and sociology says I should not be standing before you today because it was rough, yes, with a single parent in the home. It was rough with all those different experiences. But you know what? There came a point in my life where I made a choice. And this is the way, and I'm going to walk in it. And every single one of us that is going through some mess in our lives today, you have got the power to choose to have victory over that thing. Because no matter what you're born with, no matter what you grew up with, you still can choose. And the question I lay before you today is, are you going to choose? Are you going to choose victory in Jesus? Or are you going to be a pawn to your biology? Just a passive agent that, that, that your biology and sociology just moves you from left to right. Oh, you know, you grew up with this? Yeah, I'm going to put you in there. You're going to end up in jail. Yep, you no choice. You grew up with that. Yep, you, same sex, you grew up with that thing? Yep, I'm going to put you over there. No, stop this stuff now and make the right choice. And there's only one choice that you have to make. The choice is not to stop having the same-sex relationship. The choice is not to stop being a promiscuous heterosexual. The choice is Jesus. That's only one choice. Because when you make that choice, you give him the ability to make all the other choices for you. But Jesus cannot make any other choice for you until you make that one choice and you say it in your mind, God, I'm growing up with this. God, I feel this. God, I've experienced this. God, this is going on in me. Whatever your stuff is, yes, it could be homosexual. Yes, it could be whatever it is. You've got to say tonight, I'm sick and tired of being a pawn. I choose victory in my Savior Jesus. And so today, very clearly, today, tonight, Somebody needs to choose victory. I don't know what it is because we all got stuff. Don't get call, all caught up on it. Don't get caught up on, oh, well, what's this stuff and what's my stuff? When's the last time you were in the hospital and you saw the AIDS patient make fun of the cancer patient? They all sick and they all need healing. And today, there's, some, there's somebody tonight, there's somebody tonight, you know you're a pawn. You've just been pss, pss, back and forth. You're allowing that to be your excuse. You're allowing that to be your reason for doing whatever it is that you do. Well, you know, I was born this way. Well, you know, my parents did this. Well, you know, no, stop, choose. Nothing takes away your power of choice. Nothing does. And so tonight, there's something, I don't know what it is, that you need to say, God, I choose you so I can have victory over this. I don't know what it is. I don't care what it is. And some people, are probably, they might think, well, you know what? If they respond to this appeal, well, you know what the pastor's name is? I don't care what none of these folk think. Nobody has a heaven to put you in. It's a serious time now. And I'm just going to be bold. And here's the reason. I'm going to ask you to come forward. Not because it's a typical thing to do at the appeal time, but here's what I want to do. I'm making a statement tonight to the devil. Victory. 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 I make it say, if you need to choose victory over something, I just want you to come down with me. Victory over something. I don't know what it is. I'm not, you've already connected to Christ, but there's something that you need to choose victory over. I want you to come down, not because you want to stretch. I'm telling you, not because you want to stretch. It's time to go. It's a cool thing to do. But no, you have got something that is just killing you. But tonight, you're saying, God, I'm choosing you. The same-sex relationship, it's killing me, God. 
I've been excusing it all my life. I've been trying to make excuses, but God, tonight I understand that I have a choice, and the choice is you. God, this, this lying habit that I have, I grew up and saw my parents just lie all the time, and so I'm a liar. So that's why, no, God, tonight I'm choosing to do something different. God bless you all who are coming, because the devil's scared right now. Because you're doing something. You're making a choice to get victory. And that choice that you're making right now, I'm going to just prepare you for something. The devil is about to test that like he's never tested it before. Whatever's in you, he's going to do his best to pull it out of you. But the Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I want this to be a victorious campus. I want to tell you, I'm not impressed because this is a Christian Seventh-day Adventist camp. That doesn't impress me because Christian Seventh-day Adventists got the same issues with sin that everybody else does. But what impresses me is individuals who are like, I'm not just going to sing about victory. I'm actually going to live it. I'm not just going to know information about what a victorious life is like. I'm actually going to live it. We're more than conquerors. And it's about time that everyone on this campus start acting like it. Because we've got a message to give to the whole world. And I'm going to tell you this. The message is not bottled up in our ability to be able to preach it the right way or to break down Revelation and to go through Daniel and explain 2300-day prophecy. That's not simply what our message is. That's not impressive. You want to know what's going to impress the world when they see someone who once was sinking deep in sin, far from a peaceful shore, when they see someone who used to lie, but now they tell the truth. When they see someone who is all in mess, but now their life is together. Now that's evangelism. Your life. And today we all got victorious lives. I want to pray over you right now. I want to pray over you right now. Jesus. We're desperate for victory in you. Because God, if we're honest with ourselves, we're not honest with each other, but right now we gotta be honest with ourselves. We're tired of losing this battle. We lose. But God, here's what we gotta understand. And, 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 and I know that some of these folk took it from the Bible that, that, that when we're with you, all we do is win, 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 no matter what. No matter what, we win because you win. But God, we have to choose to allow you to win in our lives. And God, in order for there to be victory, there are some friends that need to be defeated. In order to have victory, there are some habits that we've just grown accustomed to that you've just got to knock down. There are some hereditary tendencies that we've grown accustomed to be in our comfort that we've got to let go of and just let you have your way. God, we want to be a victorious people. God, I am so tired of disappointing you. We are so tired of going to you for the same stuff day in and day out. We want some victory. And that's not your fault. That's ours. So God, tonight your children have just come and we've brought you our stuff. We've brought you our biology. We've brought you our, our nurture. We've just brought it all to you. And we're so glad that you don't judge us by what we bring that you don't look at us differently for what we bring. That you're not bent out of shape by some of the stuff that some individuals right here in this church are giving to you right now. You're not ashamed of it. You're not caught off guard by it. You're not shocked by it. You're not holding your mouth right now. You are just rejoicing because we're giving you an opportunity to do something incredible in our lives. Now, God, as I just get ready to close prayer, here's why, God, I need you to also help us do we don't all the time get immediate victory. And some of us, God, it's going to take some time to get this victory. And while we're on the road to victory, if we haven't gotten there yet, may we not judge the ones who have not gotten there yet.
May we not look at them and say, why aren't you there yet? Because, God, we need to be able to shout out that, you know what? I might not be what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. I may not have gotten to that destination, but God knows I'm on the right road. I'm on the right track. Yes, I'm struggling. Yes, I'm falling, but I'm stumbling towards Jesus. God, can this be a campus that stops gossiping? Can this be a campus that stops tearing different folk down when they've got their stuff? Can this be a campus where we embrace one another with all of our faults, with all of our mess? Can this campus be like Acts chapter 2? Breaking bread together daily, sharing one another's burdens, going to each other's rooms and, and, and lifting each other up. Being able to confess our faults one towards another and get healing because this place is safe. And the only reason that we'll be safe is because we've been connected with the one who's the safest. So God, I claim right now victory in the name of Jesus. I claim victory over every addiction that is right here at this altar right now. I claim victory over every habit, every tendency, everything that they have brought, God. I claim victory over it. Now, God, I don't know when that's going to come, but I pray that that will be something we have. And I know we'll have it because you got it, and now we've got you. Now, God, when we leave this place, the devil's going to test everything that's happened here. And so I pray that this will be more than just an emotional experience that this will be more than just kind of something that was a cool thing to do, but God, this will be the beginning of something new in us. God, we love you. God, we praise you. And we thank you for loving us the way you do. Love us. Care for us. And then finally, God, can you just come, like, real soon? And then can you take us home? And I know there's some of us who are thinking, oh, well, what about this? I'm missing out on all kinds of stuff. God, you're going to make up for it with an eternity of just what awesomeness. God, life is short compared to eternity. And so I want to live for that life. We love you. In Jesus' name, let all of God's victorious children say amen. And amen. Hey, if you got victory, can we just put our hands together? If you got that victory, put your hands together. God bless you. We're going to get it. We're going to get it. Get it. Praise God. Praise God. blessed by the ministry that came forth from Pastor Kelly. Put your hands together. Come on. I, I think we got some free people here. Y'all can do better than that. Thank God for what he did in this room tonight. 